Hey everybody, Maniac McGee. This is installment number 10, starting with chapter 18. Amanda tried to reason with him. You can't listen to that old coot. He's goofy. He's always saying stuff like that. You can't go because of something one nutty old coot says. Maniac pointed out that it wasn't the nutty old coot who chalked up the front of the house. Amanda laughed. That, that's no big deal. It wasn't even paint. If they really meant it, they would have used paint. And anyway, don't you know they did my mother a favor? It gave her a chance to get out the old bucket and do some serious scrubbing. Ever since the kids stopped crayoning the house, she hasn't even known what to do with herself. Now she's happy again. Maniac didn't answer. Amanda didn't understand that most of the hurt he felt was not for himself, but for her and the rest of the family. She stomped her foot. You gotta stay. I don't gotta do anything. If you go, you'll starve. Was I starving before I came here? He asked. You'll freeze to death in the winter. Your fingers will get so stiff they'll break off like icicles. I'll go somewhere. Somewhere, like the deer pen, I'll be okay. Or maybe Prairie Dog Town, huh? How about that? She jabbed him. You could go live in a gopher hole. You'd be starving, so that'd be perfect, because then you'd get so skinny you could fit right down there all snugly in their little tunnels. He shrugged. Sounds cozy. This was driving Amanda bonkers. He was acting so different, all glum all Weizsaker answers, as if he didn't care, not about anything. Yeah, she sniffed. Well, what are you going to do for a pillow, huh? I know you put my pillow on the floor. I'll use a hibernating gopher. Funny. And bathroom, huh? Where are you going to go to the bathroom? The bushes, McDonald's, lots of places. She hated it. An answer for everything. And the scariest part was he was probably right. If anybody could survive on the loose, it would be this kid that showed up from Holidaysburg, who slept on floors and who outran dogs. He was making her so mad. She pointed at him and she sneered. Well, I'll tell you one thing, buddy boy. You better shut the door on your way out and lock it, because if I get my room back, I'm not giving it up again. So don't ever come crawling back around here. And then she kicked him in the sneaker. You hear? Don't worry, he said flatly. And don't think you're taking any of my books with you this time either. And you can forget about ever getting a chance to open my Encyclopedia A, which I was almost ready to let you do before you went and started acting all poopy, he said. I'll join the library. She jumped up. Ha! You can't! No. No, you need a library card. Well, I'll get one. Ha ha! You can't get a library card without an address. She regretted it as soon as she said it. His head swung and his eyes met hers. His eyes said, Why did you say that? And her eyes couldn't answer. He got up and went out and trotted up the street. Amanda cried. She tore a magazine in half. She punched the sofa. She kicked the easy chair. She kicked Bow Wow. Bow Wow went yelping into the kitchen. See, she yelled out the front door. See what you made me do, Jeffrey McGee? Jeffrey Maniac Crazy Man Bozo McGee. He wasn't back by lunch and he wasn't back by dinner. I'm going looking, Amanda told her worried parents and no one tried to stop her. <clears throat> she rode her bike all over the East End, the West End. She even went over to Bridgeport, practically got herself killed on the bridge. She never pedaled so much in her life, and she didn't come in till after dark. When her parents headed upstairs to bed, she asked if she could stay up and watch TV. They looked at each other and said, okay. She was nodding off in the middle of some late, late movie when the door opened and in he walked. What are you doing up so late? He said. I'm incubating an egg, she answered. 
He shrugged and went upstairs, and she closed her eyes and smiled. The next morning, a little kid from three blocks away came knocking at the front door. His yo-yo string had a knot as fat as a mushroom. As Amanda watched Maniac tackle the knot, an idea slithered into her brain. When the little kid left with a string good as new, she said, Jeffrey, if I knew some way that would make it okay for you to stay here, would you? What do you mean, okay, he said. I mean that even if there's one or two people that aren't wild about you now, and that's really all there are, that even they would like you, and everybody else who already likes you, they would like you even more. Purely out of curiosity, Maniac replied, well, how's all that supposed to happen? And Amanda told him about Cobble's Knot. Chapter 19. If the wonders of the world hadn't stopped at seven, Cobble's Knot would have been number eight. Nobody knew how it got there. As the story goes, the original Mr. Cobble wasn't doing so well with the original Cobble's Corner grocery store at the corner of Hector and Birch. In his first two weeks, all he sold were some Quaker oak, oats and penny candy. Then one morning, as he unlocked the front door for business, he saw the knot. It was dangling from a flagpole that hung over the big picture window, the one that said Frosted Foods in icy blue and white letters. He got out a pair of scissors and was about to snip it off when he noticed what an unusual and incredible knot it was. And then he got an idea. He could offer a prize to anyone who untangled the knot. Publicize it. Call the newspaper. The winner's picture could be on the front page, Cobble's Corner in the background. Business would boom. Well, he went ahead and did it. And if business didn't exactly boom, it must have at least peeped a little. Because eons later, when Maniac McGee came to town, Cobble's Corner was still there. Only now it sold pizza instead of groceries. And the prize was different. It had started out being 60 seconds alone with the candy counter, but now it was one large pizza per week for a whole year, which in time made the knot practically priceless, which is why after leaving it outside for a year, Mr. Cobble took it down and kept it in a secret place inside the store and brought it out only to meet a challenger. If you look at old pictures in the Two Mills Times, you'll see that the knot was about the size and shape of a lopsided volleyball. It was made of string, but it had more contortions, ins and outs, twists and turns and dips and doodles than the brain of Albert Einstein himself. It had defeated all comers for years, including J.J. Thorndike, who grew up to be a magician, and Fingers Holloway, who grew up to be a pickpocket. Hardly a week went by without somebody taking a shot at the knot and losing. And each loser added to the glory that awaited someone who could untie it. So you see, said Amanda, if you go up there and you untie Cobble's knot, which I know you can, then you'll get your picture in the paper and you'll be the biggest hero ever around here and nobody will mess with you then. Maniac listened and thought about it and finally gave a little grin. Maybe you're just after the pizza, he said, since you know that I can't eat it. Amanda screeched, Jeffrey, the pizza's not the point. She started to hit him. He laughed and grabbed her wrists and he said, okay, he'd give it a try. And we'll pick up with chapter 20 in the next edition.